This equation is actually more difficult to solve than the ones we've seen previously. Our favorite method of separation of variables will now no longer work because what we have here involves not only first derivatives but also second derivatives. This is known as a second order differential equation. And because of that, in order to uh, solve it, we're going to have to invoke a little bit more knowledge of differential equations. But I can review for you right now in just a few minutes the key facts you need to know from differential equation theory, which will do you well if you are about to take differential equations next semester or in an upcoming semester. And also, uh, we'll make a nice quick review for you of the salient points of what you've been learning if you've been taking differential equations now or had just previously. So the first thing to notice again is that this is a second order differential equation, diff EQ. And that's going to bring us then into some general considerations from the mathematical theory of differential equations. And the central result in that theory is a very key theorem known as the existence and uniqueness theorem. And what this states for us is that because the terms which combine the derivatives together. So by this I mean all of these terms here, this E and L and the plus and the R and the plus the 1 over C, they are actually constant terms. But because these terms which are combining the derivatives together have continuous derivatives. Now after all, these are actually constants in our case. So this is a very easy condition, uh, derivatives, is a very easy condition for us to satisfy. Because of this, we know that a, a solution exists to our equation. So that's kind of nice to know. The, uh, there's something tricky here though because a solution exists, but not just one solution exists. In general, there is a wide range of solutions to this equation. There are a wide range of functions, q of t, that will actually solve it. And that presents somewhat of a difficulty for us because we would like to think, right, because we're not doing quantum mechanics here in this course, right? We would like to think that physics here is deterministic. In other words, for a given set of initial conditions, uh, oh, I just gave the key away. Right? But we would think for a given set of initial conditions for this circuit, and we just start the circuit off, we just don't get random behavior out of this circuit. Right, It should always reproduce the same behavior, the same current uh, or charge on the capacitor as a function of time every time, every time we do the experiment. But it depends on certain factors. Right, As I have been saying, it depends on what we call the initial conditions. We need to know, for example, what the initial charge on the capacitor is. Otherwise, we can't solve the equation, right? Just like when we did RC circuits, we presumed we knew the initial charge on the capacitor, and then we were able to solve to determine the future behavior of the circuit. In this case, and I'm going to write it down in the notes in a second, but in this case, because we have a second order differential equation, we actually need to know two of the initial conditions of the problem. In this case, it will be the charge on the capacitor and the derivative of the charge on the capacitor, which of course is re directly related to the current flowing through the circuit. And that makes sense because remember, the uh, inductor is going to maintain the same initial current, at least initially. And the capacitor is going to maintain the same initial charge, at least initially. And we need to know what those initial values are if we are to uniquely determine what the ultimate behavior of this circuit will be. So because right there, there exists then a 
unique solution. So we're not wasting our time searching for a solution, but a unique solution such that the charge Q at time t equals zero, right, has a certain specific value, Q naught, and then the Q dt at time t equals zero, which is also what we call our current I naught has a certain particular value. There is a unique solution once we specify these two so-called initial conditions. So these are called the initial conditions. And we know there are two of these because we're talking about a second order differential equation. A third order equation would need three. We've seen previously in the course how first order equations only need one. So these are called initial conditions or sometimes more generally we might talk about what are called boundary conditions. You might also um, be able to specify other types of conditions, uh, but you need to specify two independent conditions. So the uh, initial conditions or the boundary conditions. So we um, are well justified in seeking a solution, but we need to know what the initial charge and current are. Okay, that's the first lesson. The second lesson is that if we do happen to find some other solution to the equation which doesn't happen to satisfy our initial conditions that is as good as gold in solving this problem and I'll show you how that works in just a moment but this is something known in the parlance of differential equations as a particular solution so a particular solution is any function satisfying the Diffie Q, but not necessarily the boundary conditions, which we typically abbreviate uh, BCs. In our case, we are talking about initial that's one type of boundary condition, but I just like to abbreviate that as the boundary conditions. So it's any function satisfying that. So for example, if we found any function that obeys my equation, that the EMF equals L d squared Q, I'll call this particular solution Q sub P, dt squared, right, plus R times dQp dt plus 1 over C times Qp. This is my particular solution. Now, you might ask, what good is having such a particular solution? Well, here's where it comes in very handy. I want you to compare the two equations that we have, for one for our particular solution, and also remember our true solution, which does satisfy the boundary conditions, also satisfies this same equation. So let me just label these equations. I'm gonna call this here equation number one, I will call this one here equation number two. And what I want us to do is actually to subtract those two equations. And that's going to bring us to another type of a uh, solution known as a homogeneous solution. I'm just giving you the standard um, parlance here. The names aren't that particularly important as long as you understand the uh, mathematics, the strategy of what we're doing. So all I want us to do is to subtract our two equations. I want to do equation one minus equation two, and let's see what we get. Well now, when I take equation one and subtract equation two, the e's on this side of the equation will subtract off. So I'll just have zero on the right-hand side of my equation equals. And then I'm going to have here L dQ squared dt squared minus L times d by dt squared of qp. But because the time derivative of a difference is the difference of the time derivatives, I can combine those terms and end up with just L times d by dt squared of the true solution q minus this particular solution, which satisfies the equation but doesn't satisfy my boundary conditions. Because notice, if I take the derivative of this difference, I'll get the difference of the derivatives, and that will reproduce exactly what I get 
when I do equation one minus equation two. When I go to the next term, the r dq dt term, precisely the same thing will happen. I will have r times the time derivative then of um, q minus qp. And then finally, the last term will work as well. One over c times q minus times q minus qp. One over c times q minus qp. So what we learn here is that this difference between q and qp obeys a differential equation which is very similar to our main differential equation. The primary difference, and this is why it's called a homogeneous solution, the primary difference is that the one term that doesn't involve q at all, right, this driving EMF has now disappeared and has value of zero. So what we like to do is to define this difference of the solution we seek from any particular solution. We call that the homogeneous solution, Q sub H. And it solves the equation that I've shown for you here. And it also satisfies certain boundary conditions that we can work out. Notice that the homogeneous solution, remember, I need two initial conditions. And I will use again the value and its derivative at time t equals zero. If I evaluate my homogeneous value at zero, it should equal the value that q should and needs to have for my solution at time t equals zero. That is what we had called q naught. Minus then whatever silly wrong value my particular solution happen to have at time t equals zero. Because remember, we had a particular solution that didn't satisfy our boundary conditions. Otherwise, we would have been done just with the particular solution. Similarly, um, if I think about the time derivative of the homogeneous solution evaluated at time t equals zero, that should equal the time derivative of q evaluated at time t equals zero, which is our initial current. Right? And then we subtract off what our particular solution thought that this time derivative should be, but you know, was likely incorrect. So now what we have is a system here with two different initial conditions, right? or boundary conditions, that I have specified. And I also have this nice second order differential equation, which tells me there is now a unique solution for this Q homogeneous. The beauty of this is that this equation, as we are about to see, is much simpler to solve. And once we solve for the homogeneous equation that satisfies the differential equation, I mean the homogeneous solution, satisfies the differential equation and these boundary conditions, at the end of the day, finally, we can solve and get our final solution, Q of t, will just equal our particular solution, which we had found some way, even though it didn't satisfy our boundary conditions, and then add on the homogeneous solution, which will fix up any problems or difficulties that our particular solution was having. Now, here's the beauty of this. This is what the physics now makes the finding of this homogeneous solution extremely uh, simple. Look at the equation that Q homogeneous obeys. It is precisely the same equation that governed our original circuit. Where was that here? Right. That governed our original circuit. The main difference is that notice that we no longer have the EMF in the equation. It's just the, um, the terms involving L, R, and C. <coughs> so that means that this Q homogeneous is the solution including an initial current and an initial charge to a circuit which is precisely the same as our original circuit, but which is missing the EMF, or which has a zero programmed in for the EMF, corresponding then to an ideal wire. So our final solution then for Q homogeneous uh, solves this circuit. And the circuit we are solving now has no driving EMF. It has the L, the R, and the C. And this is where the physics comes in. Right. Notice that 
for this particular circuit now, there is no battery, there is no source of external energy. So there's no source of energy. But anytime you have any current flowing, anytime you have any I flowing, the resistor dissipates power and energy. And so eventually this uh, equivalent circuit that describes the homogeneous solution is eventually going to stop, right? Eventually there will be no more current in here and eventually the capacitor will eventually discharge completely because if there's any charge on the capacitor it will try to flow through that resistor and it will suck energy out of the system until the system finally stops. Eventually Q homogeneous at time t as time t gets large you know as it approaches infinity but at some time of course before infinity that will go to zero. And the speed at which this happens actually is going to be an exponential decay. And it happens at a rate, if you really care about the details, the key thing is to understand that this eventually goes away. It occurs at a rate which is faster than, is guaranteed to be faster than uh, the slower, whichever of these two things are slower, the time constant for the RC circuit, which of course is RC, or twice the time constant if we just had the L and the R in the circuit, which would be 2 times L over uh, R, right? Whichever one of these is the slower to decay, I can guarantee that this circuit's energy will decay away faster than whichever of those two. The key thing to understand, though, is that because of the resistance, this thing will exponentially uh, go towards zero. And that means then that at the end of the day, so the bottom line conclusion we have here is that when we solve for the final current flow, we can take any particular solution and when we add in whatever our homogeneous solution would be, this thing eventually is going to go to zero and eventually the solution will simply follow any particular solution that we found. And in circuit theory there's a special name for what this homogeneous solution is doing. This is called a transient, right? It describes a temporary behavior. The behavior of our of our, ult, of our circuit overall, the behavior of this circuit will follow the particular solution exactly, eventually. Initially, depending upon what the initial current and the initial charge in the capacitor are, when we first, say, plug this circuit into the wall outlet where the AC is happening, at the beginning there could be all kinds of strange shapes that occur, right? But eventually, the behavior will settle down to whatever particular solution we are able to find for our differential equation. And that is the bottom line then conclusion that we draw from our discussion here of solving the differential equation. Our job now and the rest of this lecture then focuses on finding a good particular solution, which will then give us the final behavior of our circuit.